Five times before, Spaceship Earth has witnessed major die-offs. Our scientific navigators say global warming has begun the sixth extinction. Its speed now depends on how quickly the planet warms, and that partly depends on feedback loops that we cannot control. Permafrost is something that is frozen for at least two summers in a row. Permafrost can be many things. It can be behind me sediment that is frozen. It can be a lot of ice in the ground, and we call that ground ice, but it could also, it could also be rocks. In permafrost, there is actually a lot of organic carbon. Why is it important is that because when the permafrost is warming, a lot of that carbon is being released, and it's being released to the ocean when we are next to the coast, or it's being released directly to the atmosphere. And the subsequent release of carbon is what we call the feedback effect, or feedback loop. The way it works is that permafrost gets warmer, the layer that thaws in the summer gets deeper and deeper every year, and the carbon that was stored in the permafrost for tens of thousands of years gets released to the atmosphere. Then that carbon, as greenhouse gas, influences the climate also, and it gets warmer. And uh, if the climate gets warmer, then we get like more thawing of that active layer in the summer. And the more thawing we have, then the more carbon gets activated. So this is what we call the feedback loop, because like one process influences the other. And that goes on until probably all the carbon that is there stored in the permafrost is used to be released in the atmosphere. Permafrost extends under all of the Arctic land masses, but it also extends out to sea. It's a kind of relic of the last ice age. If you have warm water, the water melts the seabed, the permafrost melts, and that releases methane because there's a lot of methane trapped under the subsea permafrost. And methane is a very, very powerful greenhouse gas. It's more than 20 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. So if you release a lot of methane into the atmosphere, you're going to accelerate global warming. And that, that's what seems to be happening at the moment. There are probably some below it, and I think that there's also, there's definitely some little ones right here in the surface above it. Okay. The bottom of the lake is where organic matter, which is dead plant and animal remains, is being digested by microbes. In Russian, they say that the lake is eating the permafrost, and I really like that analogy because, in fact, it is. When they digest that organic matter, they produce carbon dioxide and methane. Methane does not like to stay in the water, and it comes out of solution and forms bubbles. But there's the methane coming up right there. That's a nice example. Okay, go ahead. Well, yes, warming events can be very harmful. Today, the world is just sort of starting to show signs of the conditions we saw at the end of the Permian. The end Permian mass extinction happened about 251 million years ago. It's probably killed around 95% of all species on Earth. And we start to think, well, how could a huge amount of um, volcanic activity cause a global mass extinction like this? And most of the interest focuses on not the lava itself, but the gases that come out with volcanism. I think the main culprit we think of is, is the carbon dioxide. It started to release methane. And so what we think happened at the end of the Permian is we get this sort of runaway greenhouse effect whereby um, we're getting these two gases, methane and carbon dioxide, warming up um, the planet. 
before you know it, the world has just got so hot that it becomes extremely hard for life. And we see a sort of a mass dying of, of animals on land and in the sea, both at exactly the same time. We're just starting to see the start of, uh, of that effect. We're just at the early stages. Any report from the late Permian would say, yeah, be, be wary, be careful. The world is, is starting to break down and losing its ability to cope with greenhouse gases. And the big unknown for us today is how fast things happen. Will this happen in 50 years or will it, be, will it happen in 5,000 years? And it's really hard to know. We've never seen a trajectory in, in the history of our species like the one we're on right now. We're the first life form to become a planet-scale influence and know it. Humans have become the most powerful force uh, driving evolutionary change on the planet right now. It used to be, you know, just environmental change, and now it's us. When you're in the driver's seat on so many different factors that matter to the way the planet works, we're in a race between our awareness and our capacity to innovate and our potency. Are we destined, like most species, when we hit a resource limit to uh, have a jagged rebound period? Or can we, with this gift of foresight that we have, smooth it out consciously? A lot of that's about communication, about education, about awareness, observation. The more of that, the better. Whether it's from a satellite or, or a young activist working in the forest, the better off we'll be in the long run. We have to get comfortable with the reality that it is kind of a drama, that we now, for the first time, have this ability to observe this stuff. That means if you're a young person right now particularly, you have a special opportunity to engage and find some piece of this puzzle that you can actually affect. By 2050, things are not gonna be the same as they were in a big way. This is the first time we've had a juncture in our history as a species that's sort of this powerful and uh, wow, what a great time to be alive, especially for young people.